Welcome back to The Art of Adventure. This is episode 171 with Gret Glyer. The Art of Adventure is the podcast that helps you travel the world, run your business, and embark on an epic quest. For the show notes for this episode, check out DerekLoudermilk.com slash Gret Glyer. And that's where you will find all the show notes for previous episodes as well at DerekLoudermilk.com, that is. Speaking of adventure... I'm very excited. We're just three months away from this fall's Adventure Quest in Missouri. That's my home state in America. We, we're finalizing the schedule right now. It's October 12th to 19th. There's going to be some caving. This is adventure caving, legit spelunking, not a guided tour. Uh, there's no trains or walkways, things like that. <laughs> um, we're going to be doing rock climbing, canoeing, camping, and a business retreat in a swanky Missouri Lodge. So this is part business, part adventure, and we're going to work on different aspects of your life, your business, and yourself. So uh, I'm going to keep some of the parts secret. So it's it really will be an unexpected event. If this sounds like something you're really interested in blending business and adventure lifestyle, which is what I try to do always, then check out and apply at DerekLoudermilk.com slash AdventureQuest. Today's episode is with Gret Glyer. He's the founder of DonorC, which is a charity. It has a great app where you get video confirmation of where your dollars are going. And this is a really, a really great episode, one of my favorite recent episodes, because Gret is an open book when it comes to talking about things that other people might shy away from. So money the disparity between the richest and poorest people in the world, what makes a good or bad charity organization, getting you out of your bubble, whatever that might be, we all have a bubble. And we have a conversation about how DonorC solves this problem of getting the best result for the end user of the money. Uh, there's a lot of big, unwieldy, let's say bloated charities in the world, with a lot of bureaucracy. And Donor C, he actually talks about how it's a for-profit organization, a really interesting model there, so why he chose to do it that way. And he's, he's created this, it's essentially a two-sided marketplace, something like Airbnb or eBay or something like that that takes advantage of the reviews of who's managing the charities, the donations. When they see a problem and they ask for donations, you get to review the person who's managing that action, the aid workers. So you'll find out, you find everything there is to know in this episode. And it's, and I think you're really going to love Gret. I think you're really going to love his work and hopefully you check out the app as a result of it, but hopefully it gets you thinking about if you want to be contributing, if you want to be doing something charitable, thinking about how you're going to do that. So without further ado, here is Gret Glyer. Welcome back to The Art of Adventure, and welcome, Gret Glyer, to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Derek. It's good to be here. Yeah, and you're joining us from Washington, D.C., I believe, mm -hmm. and yeah. that seems like a good place to base a charity. And so for the for the listener, Gret is the founder of Donor C. and just give us a quick blurb of how this works. All right, great. So the basic concept behind Donor C is that it helps donors see where their money go when where their money goes when they donate. So like let's say there's a little girl in India who needs hearing aids and you want to donate to her, you would come to donorc.com or download the Donor C app, give money to help her get hearing aids and then a few days later you would get a video of her hearing for the first time. And we do that with all sorts of stuff. Um we do it with helping people get housing or uh, fighting preventable disease or clean water or all sorts of different things happening around the world. And that's that's the basic idea. So uh, we connect people who need needs overseas with uh, donors who want a really cool donation experience. And I downloaded the app in preparation for this interview. Check it out. There's there's a whole bunch of different potential places you you could donate um with little little blurbs and stuff very straight, straightforward to use it's a relatively new venture donor c right yeah I, I would say so i mean we uh we're about to be 10 months old 10 months after launch so that wow. that's pretty new yeah cool and so this is this is, you're you're donating directly to 
essentially the end user of the charity. And what's what's the main innovation here? Why is this different than other charities or donating projects? The main innovation is there's no like headquarters, there's no uh, big infrastructure. You're not paying a CEO, an accountant, and a whole bunch of other people when you make a donation. You're not paying for the air conditioning bill in some like posh uh, headquarters in the middle of DC like you are with the Red Cross or a million other organizations. Um, instead, what, what we do is we rely on it's it's a two sided marketplace, right? So there's people who need needs and then there's people who want to make donations and and the people who are presenting needs are the ones who they're the ones responsible for making sure that that your money does a good job and which makes the most sense because they're the ones right there in front of the need able to execute on it Um, and then they're also the ones responsible for maintaining their donor base so if someone tries to scam their donor base they're they're not going to be able to come back and get more donations so we we basically like pull these two groups of people together and that massively takes away our overhead costs and a whole bunch of other inefficiencies and wastefulness that you would get with a normal charity. So uh, you you have a team, I'm assuming, at least of some developers and you and, and whatnot. Where are you guys housed or do you work remotely? What, how does that work? Yeah, so we have a like our home base is is like I'm based out of the DC area but we have a so we have a small marketing team of a couple of people and then we have a development team based out of Raleigh and and we hire a lot of remote workers and contractors and things like that. Okay, cool. And uh, there's there's a lot to talk about. I mean, we'll get to it all. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. This <laughs> is a for-profit model, mm-hmm. essentially. And I saw a TED Talk last year or heard it talking about cycling events to raise money for cancer research, I believe it was. And when they increased their marketing budget, they were able to raise a lot more money. And so they, they weren't a, they were a for-profit company as well. And so they, they ended up raising, you know, something like a hundred fold money when they changed from a nonprofit to for-profit because they increased their marketing budget and they increased their reach. What's Mm -hmm. the, what's the reason why you went the for-profit route? So I wrote a lengthy blog about this that people can go to at my website, greclier.com, and it's called Donor Sees Superior Humanitarian Aid Model. But um, so if if you want the full answer, it's it's there. But the my I'll give you my, like my brief overview is the the basic reason that we use the for profit model, and and I I saw the TED talk you're talking about, and I have I have some thoughts on it because. Uh, this is very indicative of, of just like the traditional char- charity system. It's all about how can you fundraise money? How can you get money into your doors? How can you blah, blah, blah. And there's so little conversation about what's the best thing for the people that you're trying to help. What's the best way to help those people? So the reason that we did a for-profit model is because it's it was what was in the best interest of the people that we're trying to help overseas. So like some background on me, I spent three years living in Malawi and there's all of these like 501c... 501c3 registered charities that are supposedly doing work in this like remote African country that I I lived in for three years, and they they're telling their donors they're, they're doing one thing, and then you go over to, to the other side of the world, in Malawi and other places in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and these charities are not doing nearly as much as as they're saying, and they're not doing a good job of it, and they're not, they're just not run well. They're not run like a corporation. They're run like a, a nonprofit, which is basically means they're not results oriented. Uh, so the reason with that, the reason for the for-profit model was um, it allowed us to be a lot more efficient and a lot less wasteful and a lot like it, it, enabled, it enabled us to get aid to people faster without going through a gluttony of paperwork. Okay, cool. And take me through the process. Some, some aid worker somewhere sees a need and they post on donor C. How does the, how does the money go from donors uh, and get to the end user? Okay, so the the money. So like, let's say you're scrolling through and you see a, a girl named Nicole, and she's posted about a little girl who was bitten by a crocodile and is about to die, which is something that happened a few months ago. So you see that, and you say, okay, I want to help that girl, and you donate to her, and the money goes into Nicole's bank account, and then Nicole is responsible for getting that money to the little girl. Often, because if you go on our on our website or, or use our app, you'll see that it's very very small amounts. So often what happens is Nicole will just pay for the money on the front end, the hundred, like in that case, the thing was like $100, and she'll just pay for the money on the front end, and then she's reimbursed on the back end for the money that was raised. Um, so she doesn't like actually do like a wire transfer or anything like that. As long as the same, same amount comes in as goes out, she's happy. And is it always the, the aid worker, the money goes into their account, and then they sort of pay out to the 
people that need it on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is done through the aid workers. And what's the incentive for the aid worker to participate in this versus their normal aid work? Uh, I mean, <laughs> aid workers like working with us because we're they actually get to be effective and use like do important things. Like a lot of time, a lot of times when you're working for a big organization, as I mean, I'm, I'm sure on this podcast, the Adventure Like Business podcast, there's all sorts of people who have worked for a really large organization and felt like they're accomplishing nothing or accom- like not doing very much. Mm. Um, so I, I think a lot of our aid workers, they are getting some money to play around with and do some actual good in the world instead of being like constricted to whatever bylaws their corporation or their organization is forcing them to be a part of under under their jurisdiction. So for so I think our aid workers just they see all of these I mean they're living out in in these third world countries. They're seeing needs all the time and they, they they've never been able they've been helpless to do something about it. And now all of a sudden they have an app where they can start making a difference in the world. So I mean they're just they're good people. I was wondering about sometimes I'm traveling in a developing country and I meet someone that could really use some help and I try to help when I can or design a website for someone or, or whatever it is, can a average citizen who sees a need, can they post onto donor C? They can. Um, most of the time, if it's like your first time posting donor C would basically work as like a crowdfunding platform for that first, uh, for the first few times. And after you, it's kind of like YouTube, right? The first time you're posting videos on YouTube, you're posting it for your friends and family. But if you're good at posting YouTube videos and you're making good content, eventually other people will catch on and, and they'll start watching you. And, and then if you do a really good job, you can, it'll really catch on. So it's kind of similar with donor C. The first few times people post, it's just going to be a crowdfunding platform for them and their friends. But if they get really good at it, and it seems like a lot of people trust them, then our algorithm bumps them up and they, they, they can get access to um, our, our donor traffic. Cool. Can you talk about how many people or dollars are using DonorC? Uh, I can say that we're in over 50 countries. That's what I'm allowed to say. My investor, I used to like just like blurt out all of our numbers um, and my investors <laughs> didn't like that. Uh, so yeah, but the thing I'm allowed to say is we're in over 50 countries and we're doing very well given our age. So, like obviously we're not the size of the Red Cross, but we're we're doing we're doing very very well for a ten month old uh, organization. And are you paying yourself a salary? Uh, I I have an income, but totally separate from donor C. So yeah, I, I'm my salary is zero dollars. I've actually thought about doing, and maybe I'll get your opinion on this. I thought about doing like a marketing campaign because I think there's a lot of CEOs of these big charities like the Red Cross who are paying themselves half a million bucks, and uh, I think it'd be I, I think it'd be kind of eye opening if I kind of played into that like hey there's these salaries or these there's these charities making a ton of money and meanwhile the the ceo of donorcy is uh making zero dollars so i don't know i think that i've thought about doing something like that oh just out of curiosity what is your do you have another business that's providing you passive income um basically so i was i spent the three years living overseas and uh while I was doing that, I developed a like a support network of people who just like support the work that I do. So it mostly comes from that. Um, and then also like I know how to make videos and stuff. So I'll do the occasional wedding and, and things like that. But yeah, that's the that's the main thing there. OK, cool. Let's talk about Malawi. I, I don't know much about it. I assume it's pretty poor. What what are the what are the living conditions like there? And, and what did you see there that? drove you to want to be in the charity business in the first place? Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, when I was in Malawi, I was looking for, or I, I, when, I, when I first moved there, I thought I was going to see like just complete destitution. No, I th- like literally on the plane ride, on my first plane ride over there, I thought like I would not be, I would not be taking a hot shower for the next year. Um, and I thought all these different things. Anyways, when I got there, I had like this nice house. I had hot water, air, air conditioning. I had Wi-Fi. It wasn't very fast, but it was, it worked. And a whole bunch of other like nice amenities that, that you just wouldn't expect. Right. And this is, this is uh, Malawi. Two out of the last five years, Malawi has, has ranked as the worst, the poorest country on the planet. Um, so I was, I was surprised by that, that the, there's these like nice things in this really um, just like poor country. And so I thought, Oh, that's, that's strange. And I spent a couple months like uh, hanging out in this, like one little compound that I was on where they had all the nice houses. And then eventually I got taken out to a local village, just like 20 minutes outside of the city. And that's when I realized, oh, this is what the world lives like. This is what most of the world lives like. Like mo- I, in your your opinion or in your 
perspective and my perspective and, and most people who grew up in the first world, we think like we think the maj- the vast majority of the planet lives in like these like nice cities or suburbs and they have access to all this stuff. But that's not true. And the people living in these like remote villages, they were living on a dollar a day. They have no electricity, um, no running water. If they're lucky, they have like a little pump in the middle of their village to get water from underground. So their water is clean. If not, they just have dirty water that they drink. And yeah, I mean, it's like mud huts, the like anything, the the typical stuff that you would think of. That's what the majority of the world is lives lives like. And when you went to that village for the first time, what what was going through your head? Yeah, that's a man. That was a that was a while ago. I I remember thinking it was just surreal. Like I I have it vividly in my brain right now. Like I I can like perfectly remember that like first trip where I'm like walking through and seeing all these like look I'm like it's it's just eye opening it's kind of like uh, I almost feel like it was uh it was like that scene in the matrix where what's his name neo took the red pill and it's yeah. like this whole new world opens up it's like oh my gosh oh my gosh there's like so much stuff there's so many things i didn't know about like i i just it's, it's like that experience where you're just you're sitting around and all of a sudden you realize there are 7 billion people on the planet like i've my whole life i'm uh i'm half white, half Hispanic. Most of the people around me have been like growing up were like lighter skin or whatever. And I was always like, I was all as, as someone who's like lighter skin, I was always in the majority. And for the first time I'm, I'm in the minority, I'm the one white guy walking through this village. And there's these people who are make who make so little money. I mean, these people are making a dollar a day. Meanwhile, the the zip code I'm from, the average median household income in the zip code I'm from was like $150,000. And there's this whole village of people where one person's salary could take care of everyone in the village for the rest of their life in terms of their basic needs. And, but in that first time I, I was walking through that village, I met this lady named Rosina, super old lady, like 70 something years old. And she hadn't eaten in a week. And you just, it's just one of those things. It's like your, your whole world falls out from underneath you. Hmm. And I'm curious about like the happiness levels of the people there you know, we we all sort of get used to our standard of living, whether you're richer or poorer, you just sort of acclimatize to it. Yeah. Did did people seem happy or? Yeah, uh, I would say in general, yeah. Uh, there's it's uh, they, and just in general, they're more expressive. It, it's like they're more emotive than 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 us. I, I think a lot of uh, I think we kind of live, live very numbed down lives. Like we're just so comfortable. And we like we distract like if something gets if if we start to get bored, we'll distract ourselves with a smartphone. And if we start to get sad, we'll just like put on Netflix and forget about the world for an hour or two or four. And and then but these people don't have things like that. And so they like when something is sad, they they're sad about it when something is. um, But like their normal everyday life is pretty joyful because that's what normal everyday life like actually is. But you can't really, <laughs> you can't really experience that if you're, if you're like so fearful of, of the negative parts of life as well. Mm. This is good stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Were you, were you motivated immediately in that village? You said, okay, I want to try to help these people get, get food to, to this woman who hadn't eaten or, you know, right then did you say, I want to, I want to make something happen? Yeah, well, I mean, the immediate thing, I was I was brought out into that village by a guy named Blessings. And he was, I at some point I told him, hey, Blessings, if Blessings was a guy who's from a village and he was like at this, he was living at this compound where I was living. And I told him at one point, if you ever need help with anything, just let me know. I didn't know what I was asking, what I was saying. I was just kind of like, hey, <laughs> like, if you ever need help with anything, let me know. And so he brought me out to this village to show me what it was like. And so he, he brought me to this lady and, and her name was Rosina. She hadn't eaten in a week. And I was like, okay, how much money, what what does she need? She needs food, right? How much is it going to cost her to feed her for like a month? And he said, okay, it's $7. Well, $7 will buy her this giant bag of maize that she can use to make the food that she likes. And for a month she'll be fed. But that wasn't like the, that wasn't, even though she hadn't eaten in a week and she was starving, that wasn't her biggest concern. Her biggest concern was there was a, a month left before rainy season started and she was homeless. So rainy season isn't rainy. Se- uh, it's not like a little nice shower here in America. Like rainy season, think of like Jumanji. It's like a, a really bad downpour um, <laughs> for just hours or days on end. Like really, really, like you can't see a foot in front of you kind of, it's like a waterfall all over, like 
all over the country or or the, the area. So that's like very dangerous, especially for an old lady who like isn't eating very much. Uh, so she needed a house, and I'm, I'm like, how much is it going to cost to build this lady a house? How am I going to pull that off? And he's like, well, it's going to be very very expensive. It's going to cost like. Eight hundred dollars, and I'm thinking eight hundred bucks. I can't. Be- I can't believe this. I can't believe how much, uh, how much things cost around here. No one has ever told me about this. No one knows about this. It's weird. And so I, I had a camera with me, and I gave it to Blessings, and I said, "Film me. I'm going to film myself talking in front of talking with Rosina and, and explaining how she's homeless and she needs a new house." And you can find there's this video uploaded, you know, years ago um, that's still on YouTube somewhere. And yeah, I mean we. I immediately wanted to like do something about it. So I, I, I filmed the video. It was one of the first videos I ever made. And I had my friends, uh, and I had my friends like donate the money to build her a house. And, and I think the, um, the cool thing was that the house got built. The roof was put on the house like the day before, uh, the first really big rain mm. of the season. So it was like a just in time kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. I think a lot of people wouldn't have made that video or they wouldn't have been so proactive. What do you, what do you think? It is about you that that let you just say, okay, let's just do this right now. You know, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me because I've always thought, you know, there's the way I think about it. I was given so much, like I when I was growing up, and a lot of my, I think it's, I think it's a lot of it is perspective. A lot of people fall into the trap where they compare themselves to like the ten people that they like interact with on on their most regular basis. So like sometimes they interact with their family, sometimes they interact with their boss, their coworkers, whatever, and they think, oh, this is representative of all of humanity. And there's no reason for me to get involved and like help out humanity because look, the ten people around me are are doing just fine and and like if i were to help so i mean like look I, i'm not even doing as well as my boss is doing look at how well my, my boss is doing. so they they, mm-hmm. they play this com- compare game and if people just like for somehow i and this is a big part of why i started donor I mean, if you start if you download donor and you start like scrolling through the projects you can see that anyone who's got a smartphone in their hand and they're scrolling through these projects they know okay this is like I live a very different life. At least they should know that. They they should be able to like look at these projects and, and say like, wait a second, something's going on here. So um, I think a big yeah, I think that's I think that's it. I think a big problem is like perspective and just not like really understanding like how lucky they are to be born into the place that they're born into um, and how much they need to. Not I mean they don't need to get involved, but like I I just think that they would want to more if they if they had more of an appreciation for kind of the 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 disparity between them and the rest of the world. Maybe you can weigh in on something that I've been turning over in my own mind, in my own life. This idea of, should I get rich first? Should I devote all my energy to getting rich and then use that money, which would be like 100x more uh, than if I was just, you know, living at the poverty line, volunteering my time for a charity organization? Um, should I should I do that and use the money to, say, donate to lots of projects through donor C or should I, should I be donating along the way as I, as I try to build, build wealth and build leverage or should I just, you know, give as much as I can immediately? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I never like to give, uh, I, I have a hard time giving like blanket recommendations because there, there's going to be a situation where I'm wrong, right? Like I could say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, in general, you want to donate like somewhere between like 25%, let's say. That's like a generous amount of your income, right? I don't know. That's just like a number I pull out. And the, but for and some the Bible people, always be, said yeah. like 10%, tithe 10% or whatever, you know? So that was yeah. like a historical set point. Yeah. And, and I can talk about that. And, and so like the in, in biblical times, 10% of your income was like massive. You're spending like half of your income on your food. And so like 10% of your income is like a lot. It's like, that would like be really, really painful for the average person back then. So like 10% of our income now seems kind of like a weird, like it's just not comparable. I think that, so anyways, the thing I always tell people is you should give if, and this is just like personal life advice. I'm not saying like what you should do, or I'm saying this is what you should do if you want to feel like fulfilled and kind of, and happy and like you're doing your part. Just give until there's some kind of sacrifice being made. Give until like you're giving something up to, to, to to give so like for example most people they like let's say they're they're giving 10 percent. most of that is like the frothing off of the top of their drink it's like they don't even want it anyway it's like they, they it's, <laughs> it makes no difference whether they have it or they don't and you can do that and that's fine i'm i'm, and I'm sure the people who the recipients of that money are will be very grateful for that but when was the last time someone didn't go on vacation because they gave so much or when was the last time you had to like 
curb how much money you were spending, like the uh, the video games you're buying or your Netflix subscription or whatever? When was the last time you had to make a decision like that because you were giving away so much money? Um, so like, I would say if, if you want to find contentment, if you want to see it be like, I feel good about like my contribution to the world, my my personal advice to that person is give to the point where like you're, it, you feel it, like it actually there's some kind of sacrifice within you being made so that that thing can happen. And that that's going to look different for everyone. So, and you're, and you asked kind of like a, almost like a, a completely different question, which is, should I wait to get richer later on? And I think that's a fine thing to do. My concern is a lot of times I see that as like a, as people just basically making, they're, they're, they're justifying like not caring about the third world and not everyone has to care about the third world or whatever, but that's often what it is. It's, it's not often like, it's it's more often than not, I think it's like an excuse. It's like, oh, I don't have to, I'm going to get rich later on and I'm going to do so much good in, in this hypothetical situation where I'm super rich that what I do right now doesn't matter. And, and you know, there's, there are genuine people who, who make that decision and they are actually working to make a lot of wealth so that they can help a lot of, like that's actually their goal. Most people just want to be wealthy and they just want to be comfortable and that's their primary motive. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I just, I, I do think it's important to be honest about that. Hmm. My solution at this point is to come up with a mathematical formula that says I have to give double each year. Mm-hmm. So uh, oh, the I like year I, I started with a hundred bucks, and uh, this year we're at two thousand. Um, but at some point, the, it will far surpass the global GDP. So I, I that formula won't be <laughs> able <Yeah>. to <laughs> and be used forever. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, that's an, an interesting rule. I, I mean, I, I like that. I think that's and that's cool. That you've like set something up for yourself, and you're trying to do something like you're trying to stick to it and stuff. But I like that. Yeah, and actually, some some of the ways we do charity and raise money for charity is to have events or parties that like people pay to participate in and then the the money goes to a local organization somewhere we can just walk down the street and give them the money and it's 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 exciting right because then you get to party for charity and i think that's how pencils of promise got its start was like through through live events and i want to want to get your opinion on this i've i've had a thought to start some sort of organization or movement or charity or however you call it to send people on adventures so that they get to experience going on an adventure. And while they're out there traveling the world, they get to implement some project that they think is going to be meaningful. And then they come back and they tell stories about it. And perhaps the storytelling nights or films that they make about the work that they do are what drives the funding and then they become they become a mentor and sort of sort sort of like angel investing where you like help younger adventurers do these things. Do you have any thoughts about what might be useful um, or about the model for how that might work? Yeah, so I've seen that's interesting because I, I see a lot of like short term mission trips and I see a lot of people like you know I'm sure same as you you've just like met a ton of people doing traveling the world doing adventure and stuff like that. I think my first. Like I'll put it this way, my first I spent three years living in Malawi, and my first year in Malawi, I was I I built like a couple house. I was I was kind of useless in terms of like what I was able to accomplish there because I just didn't understand the culture. I didn't understand my ability to like get involved, and even like the people I was the like the organization I was with that first year, they even said like just don't do anything for the first six months. Just spend six months like learning everything that you can. And I think that they the reason that they told us that. Like it was like a group of us, like young Americans, recently graduated from college. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason they told us that is because like Americans really think that they know everything. Um, they really think that they can just like show up into any country in the world where they don't even speak the language <laughs> and just start like saving everyone. And it's not the case. So my so my first year, you know, I accomplished a couple things, but for the most part, I just like hung out and learned about the people there. The second year, I actually started like a 501c3 charity. We built um, 100 houses for orphans and widows, and we did a a bunch of other stuff. And then my third year, it was like, it was like the same exponential increase that that year, we like built a school and did a whole bunch of other cool stuff. And it was, it was great. But it really took three years for me to to leave something with that country that was like, okay, this is going to make a massive impact. And so I think that the tough thing with the, um, with the model where you're going on an adventure, yeah, so the most effective way for someone who's going to go overseas and like 
adventure and all that stuff is is basically to be honest about it and say, you know what, I'm going to go overseas and I, I might, I probably won't be that helpful. In fact, I might be kind of annoying to the people I'm with. Like I might be kind of a burden. I might be kind of a distraction, but I'm going to go overseas with the intention of learning more about myself and just doing my best to like stay out of people's way. Like often that those are the people who end up being the most helpful, like actually helpful. Whereas the people who go overseas, like I'm going to go change the world are the ones who end up being the most annoying. And I, I know that because I've hosted these people, right? They've come and I've, I've tried, I've like, I've, I've hosted these short-term mission teams and all these people. And the ones who think they're there to like really change the world are usually the ones who are like the biggest burden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's good. To, that's good to know. Um, yeah. Those, this, this is me giving you my, my, uh, just my very honest thoughts <laughs> about about what you're saying because I've seen quite a bit of it, so yeah, I, I like to. Just and and be, the uh, goal, the goal here is to is to really just get people out on adventures to go through some epic trial, um, whatever that may be. And if there's something useful that comes out of it, then that's a bonus. Yeah, and I think that that is perfect. That's exactly what it should be like. Cool. So let's let's talk a little bit about. Donor C, what what ideas? How did how did that get started? Because you you were building houses in Malawi, and then now you have this other now you have Donor C instead of the five hundred one C organization that you had there. How did the idea come about? And then what what were the key sort of influences that led to it looking like it does today? Yeah, so the basic thing was my second year in Malawi, like I talked about, I, I started that 501c3 charity where we, we were building houses for people. And even then, every house that we built, we would uh, create a video for the donor. Okay. So we, that was something that the idea of like giving people feedback on their donation was something I was doing years ago. And people really liked it. But at the same time, I, I kind of like I was peering into the I had this this housing ministry and you can still uh, it still runs you can still donate like we we still build several houses a month through it um just because it has that kind of viral effect but the thing I, that was happening i was looking into the future and i was like i could i could really grow this thing i could tell that we had like a catchy tagline where you can build a house for the price of an ipad and i could just tell okay this is like catchy people would talk about this and and i would i would get on interviews about this and people would really like i could really blow this up and just build so many houses all over Africa. And I, I was looking at that and I was like, I just don't want to do – I don't think that's what's in the best interest of these people uh, out here because it's it's complicated to build a house, right? It takes a lot of care and precision from the people who are involved. And I don't just mean the construction, but when you're building a house for someone in the middle of a village, you're working – there's like – there's chiefs and there's like very specific cultural customs to that specific village and very specific language barriers to that specific village. And so I knew I could raise a ton of money just like all of these other charities talk about um, – like that guy who did the TED Talk talks about there are ways to raise all this money. And that's true and I could have raised a ton of money, but then I was so – not excited about how well I could implement that, that I, I decided I'm not going to, I'm not going to pursue this thing. So I was looking, I was like, what can I do that's more scalable and that makes an impact, but at the same time keeps the one-to-one -one compassion that I was having with building these houses for people on an individual basis. That's what I wanted to re retain. And I knew I couldn't do that. I knew I could not do that if I did charity the traditional way. So then I started doing these, um, these videos, I did like a YouTube series called Village Fridays, where every Friday I would like, I would be like, okay, there's this person who needs a need, or, uh, the, or this village who needs something, and let's fundraise for them. Let's let's put mosquito nets in their village, or let's uh, provide this family who is who has AIDS with, uh, let's provide them with a uh, sustainable pig farm, and do all sorts of other stuff. Anything you can think of, we did. Um, and then, then the big thing that we did was raise a hundred thousand dollars to build a girls' school in rural Malawi. And that's the type of thing that's like really sustainable. I mean, there's 120 girls going to school right now, changing lives. And I was looking at all of these different things I was doing. And I thought, you know what? There's not like a big charity. People just are excited to give and actually make an impact and see their money make an impact. How can I take this like I, this thing that I've done where I'm fundraising using video and all the other stuff? How can I take that and create a whole platform on it? So it's not just Greg Lyre helping people in Malawi, but what if there's people in – Thailand who want to fight sex trafficking? What if there are people in India who want to work in the slums? What if there's, you know, I wanted people all over the world using this platform and using this type of like one-to-one -one 
donation mechanism to like make a real impact in people's lives. And that's kind of where that was the genesis of donor C. How can I, how can I not create the coldness? How, how can I avoid the coldness and distance of a really large organization and keep everyone still like compassionate and relational and still provide aid in a very, in, in a very close knit kind of way. Do you think that there is a place for large organizations, maybe some problems that that would take um, a lot of infrastructure and, and things to get a handle on? Yes, I think the thing that I always say is the the best types of aid are the ones that are highly either highly decentralized or highly specialized. So donor C is the perfect example of decentralized aid. Basically, there's no big oversight. It's just the market doing its thing. People are are giving money, and the people who do the best job of executing on that money are the ones who get the profit on it. Then there's there's highly specialized aid, which is which are these large organizations that, that actually do a good job. Like the Against Malaria Foundation, they're one thing. They do one thing. They're a multi-million dollar organization, and they do one thing. They provide mosquito nets for people in remote villages in Africa to, to fight malaria. Um, same thing with Give Directly. They're an organization. They do one thing. They give unconditional cash transfers to people out in Kenya and Ethiopia. And they just focus on that one thing. They don't, they don't innovate. They don't try and do a better job than they were doing yesterday. They, they just do, they, they, they don't try and do anything different. They focus on their one thing. And when they do that, they're able to highly scale and like affect a lot of people's lives. And there's still like the coldness and distance there, but it's, it's so helpful, right? Charity Water is another example where, where their, their one thing is providing clean drinking water to the 600 million people who don't have it on this planet. So whenever you have like highly specialized aid, that's a, a really effective way to use your money. And then highly de- decentralized aid would, would be um, another great way. And there's they're different, but they're both they're both they're both very important. Okay, good. That makes me feel good because we've been doing a lot of charity water projects. Oh yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Do you? This is sort of a out of left field question. Do you support, uh, or would you support getting rid of mosquitoes if we use the CRISPR technology to basically eliminate <laughs> yeah. them? That is a good question. I, uh, I I wish I knew enough about all of the biological implications of that. I, I don't want to be the guy who says like, yeah, let's get rid of all mosquitoes, and then some like insane global uh, disaster happens because of that. You know, I just don't know enough about that stuff. Uh, I, I wish I did. So yeah, I mean, my, my ba- I, it's kind of lame, but I just don't know. Sure. <laughs> but I, I I love the idea of people not having malaria. Obviously, I'm not against that. <laughs> yeah, it's um. You, it's un, unpredictable downstream effects. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, uh, initially, I read Three Cups of Tea, you know, probably eight or nine years ago. Greg Mortensen, the the mountaineer, um, was building schools in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Yeah. And then there's Pencils of Promise, which I believe they're building schools. And the idea of going and building a school and having something physical you can point to is very appealing and and you you built a school as well what do you see are the pros and cons of doing something like building infrastructure i think uh that's a good question and so there's you asked me about the pros and cons of building infrastructure but you also brought up pencils of promise and i i think the thing that i don't want to like your your friend who referred us laden he he talked about his his thoughts on pencils of promise and mine are very similar so if someone wants to go and listen to that podcast they can they can listen to it but the idea of building infrastructure is really is really important and, and in fact uh donorcy does that too so we do a lot of really small projects but we're also like nearly complete building an orphanage in, in uganda like we're there's going to be like 200 kids who come off of the street and start living on in this orphanage in uganda and they're going to be able to get an education and go to college and their lives will be completely changed and these are kids who would otherwise just be on the street their entire lives probably die, half of them would, would probably die from a disease at some point or starvation and these kids lives are going to be completely different because of that so I think um, infrastructure is really important, and yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pro infrastructure when it when it makes sense for sure. And and when doesn't it make sense? It doesn't make sense when it's not sustainable, um, and, and that's kind of the the problem. That that's my concern I have with organ with uh, organizations like Pencils of Promise. They they build schools I think for the price of twenty five thousand dollars, and you know schools are very complicated, and they. Uh, 
they cost money to run and they cost money to keep up. And I know because I built one, right? The school I built was $100,000. And it's not like we, we raised $100,000 and it was like, cool, everyone. All right, we did our part. Time to like move on to the next thing. Like that's not how it works. Like I'm still involved in that school to this day. And I'm on, um, like there's there's a whole board member. There's there's people who are like working to grow it and um, make all sorts of really difficult decisions about it. I mean, education is a, is a, is a very tough thing. And so this, it, I'm skeptical of the guy who's just going around building twenty five thousand dollars schools all over the place because everyone wants to say i built the school anyone who has money wants to say oh here's twenty five thousand dollars put my name on the school let me know when it's done like <laughs> that's an appealing thing right but and like i said there's all sorts of ways to fundraise money but how are like what is it that's that's going to actually make an impact how, how are we going to like make sure that each school that's built does a really good job and to um so I don't have an answer for that for the pencils of, of promise, uh, gentlemen. But the I will say I know that that Charity Water that they recognize this problem, right? They they were around for like six or seven years, and then all of a sudden they realized, wait a second, some of our wells that we're building are breaking, and we're spending all of this money, we're spending thousands of dollars per well, and then they're breaking. So what do we do about this? So they developed a whole new technology using uh, I think Google Grants to make sure that so that they could tell when a well broke, and they would attach this device to each well. Um, they could tell with, like with the GPS coordinates and all that stuff. Okay, this well is broken. It's not working properly. Someone needs to fix it. And then they would raise separate money to go and fix those wells. I think mm. the that was called pipeline. And so you can donate specifically to that to that pipeline. And they they recognize that as a problem. So I think um, infrastructure doesn't make sense when it's when it's not done when when it's not sustainable. So what with this orphanage that you're building? What sustainable considerations do you have to take into account? Right. So this is what's what's so important about what we do, which is we work through these aid workers who are on the ground. So these are people who are who have invested in their communities often for decades. And what and it's their job, basically, their job is going to be to upkeep this thing and figure out what's necessary. Um, and sometimes that means like raising more money. Sometimes that means um, like creating uh, using the, the land that the orphanage is on to farm and, and produce revenue that way it um there's there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it but the the main thing is there has to be someone in charge and that's the hardest thing to replicate you can't sorry that's the hardest thing to replicate you can't um just like go and blanket schools all over the place and not have like really talented people heading up each and every one of those schools that's that's the thing that's like i'm not sure that's that's going to happen so like the school that i built in malawi there's a lady named Tia, and Tia is in charge of everything. She's the headmistress of the school. She's in charge of like the budget, of the tuition prices, of everything, and it's her job to keep that school afloat. And it's her. It's been her dream for seven years to make sure that these girls in this remote village have a school. And now she's like realizing her dream, and she's doing an amazing job. And I know that that school will not only exist in ten years, but it's going to be ten times bigger. Uh, like we have the land to massively expand, and all of that I knew could happen because of Tia. So um, mm -hmm. I, I would say. The, 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 in the case of the orphanage, there's a lady named Kristen Johnson, and Kristen Johnson is putting her entire being into making this orphanage a reality and running it and, and changing people's lives with it. And she cares so deeply about the kids. And I think it's that like compassion element that gets so often lost with these mega charities. Any any like type of big aid, uh, like Red Cross, like any any of these people who are who have these large organizational infrastructures. There's that one to one compassion where there's someone on the ground who's like really caring for the people. Often those people get turned into employees. Um, and so I think the thing that that Donorcy does with every single project is we have that we we don't extract the compassion component and we make sure it stays in there. Gotcha. Yeah, it sounds like having a single person who's sort of in charge of the project means that that it's gonna as long as that person is around probably and maybe maybe they'll pass it on but as long as that person's around then the project will have have the sustainability that mm -hmm. it needs yes cool um uh you're already in 50 countries what's what's happening as you scale or what are the hurdles you're running into yeah, so what, there's a whole. That's a good question, and I, I guess like your your business listeners, this this will be in, <laughs> the first like interesting part to them of our discussion. But uh, basically, like one of the things is you know, revenue is kind of unpredictable, right? So especially in like the charity world, and it's my first time like really going through this. So I, you know, one of the things you don't realize is um, December is like one of the top giving months of the entire year. And then, so, you know, we're like skyrocketing. December is great. And then uh, January was, uh, our, our January numbers were like half of December. And I looked at that and I was like, what? 
this is a disaster. What what just happened? And I and then I just oh okay, this is normal. This is like what charities do. Like December is the giving month, and then January is the off month. People just don't people don't give as much during January, which is fine. That's how it is. So we're looking at that, and and so like it's always like okay, what are the problems? What are the things that we're facing, and how can we solve that? So one of the things that we're face that we had been facing was predictable revenue, and one of the ways we're solving that is through offering the ability for our users to sign up to give monthly, and people love giving on our site monthly because, like this is I mean it's it's a little bit complicated, but it, it, the way it works is. is in in practice in uh, is is really cool. So what happens is someone signs up to give either 30 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month or whatever it is that they want to give and let's say they sign up to give 30 bucks a month. What we do is we take that $30 and we split it across three different projects, $10, $10 and $10. And those th- those three different projects then go on to completion. Sometimes it's building an orphanage. Sometimes it's giving a kid hearing aids. Sometimes it's providing uh, clean water to people. Whatever it is, your $10 goes to that, those things, and then you get video updates showing you what each $10 did. And this happens every single month. So every single month, you're getting video updates on these on the three different projects that you're contributing to. And it's three different projects every month. So you just get this like really cool, like, wow, my money is being thrown out to all of these global aid workers all over the planet and they're doing amazing things with it um and so i think that's that's kind of the the thing that we've uh we've done to solve our our unpredictable revenue problem brilliant perfect let's see uh i'd love to just give you the opportunity if there's something that i haven't asked you about that you think is important to touch on yeah i would like to say one of the things i talk about a lot just like in my personal life and in my my blog is i love talking about the bubble that people live in i I think people a lot of times people don't realize how uh, paralyzing that is, um, and how much like better your life can be if if you take a second to step outside of the things that are normal and comfortable to you. So um, sometimes that means that you're a, a Republican and, and you need to see what Democrats think, or you're a Democrat and you need to see what Republicans think. Sometimes that means that you're uh, a really wealthy person and you need to see what poor people live like. And in in and the thing, the bubble that I like to really try and push people outside of to, to just just take a second to step outside of and see what your life is like is the basically like the first world bubble. So the the thing that people don't realize is if you make if you make thirty two thousand five hundred dollars a year, you're living in the global one percent. So you're making more money than half of the planet. And then if you want to make more money, it's not like there's a straight line down. If you want to make more money than fifty percent of the planet, it's not sixteen thousand dollars a year you have to make it's like six hundred dollars in a year if you make 600 bucks in a year all of a sudden you're wealthier than half of the people living on planet earth right now so i think the thing that i want to push people to to think about is how do you get outside of your bubble and live a life that is a lot more compelling and a lot more aware of all of the other humans that you're like on the same planet with and um yeah, just I, I I like to push people to do that, right? How much money do you make, and then look at how much money you make, and try and take a second to think about uh, what you can do for the people on this planet who are like like the lady Rosina who we talked about earlier, making a dollar a day, haven't eaten in a week, don't have a house, things like that. There's there's, I mean, Rosina is not. Uh, one in a million. She's one of a million. There's a million other Rosinas. There's a million other of these uh, of these like kind of sad stories, and and we really can do something about it. So I I like to to pre- to to push people to to look at at that sum. Mm. You know, digital nomads take advantage of the geo geo arbitrage is the term, I guess. Um, like I'm in Croatia right now, living uh, my cost of living is less than it is when I'm in America. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you were saying like the, the house to build is an $800 house, you know, that's, that's way cheaper than, than most places in the world. So it seems like your charity dollars can take advantage of that to your arbitrage as well. You have more leverage in places where everything is cheaper. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, and that's the thing that people don't that just are not aware of. That's the thing I wasn't aware of for so long because no one like charities don't say that for some reason. I wonder if it's part of their whole fundraising shtick is they they want to raise as much money as possible, so they don't mention how cheap everything is because if they do, maybe people would give less money or or, or they're worried about that. Mm. But like, just go to donor see and you like literally mm. like um, you can buy a kid a sh- shoes for. 15 bucks you can you can do all sorts of stuff for very small amounts of money um and and i think one of the thing one of the advantages you have with with donorcy is the granularity right you can actually there's very very small little projects that you can like be a part of and change someone's life with on a very very micro level compared to what's what's existed before 
Brilliant. Well, I think I think it'll probably be really rewarding to get those monthly updates and videos and like I think that's that's great. People are gonna get feeling feeling good about what they're doing. Um, yeah, I hope so. It's like an automated thing. It's easy that people te- seem to like it because of that. Yeah, um, especially for the 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 business guys who are who have a million other things going on and don't have time to like sort through and pick out projects every month. You know, they they're the ones who who tend to gravitate towards that feature. Yeah, ob- yeah, absolutely. Um, I have I have one one question. It's just sort of unrelated, but um, it just popped into my head. Uh, I'm curious about music in Africa. And mm-hmm. so, so this will be my, my final question. Did you have any interesting musical experiences while you were in Malawi? Uh, musical experiences. I think the, th- the only thing that really comes to mind immediately is it's almost, it's almost like everyone is just naturally musically talented. Like everyone has perfect pitch, like all the little kids, all the ladies singing in the village, they're singing all the time. I think they sing at, at church every Sunday and it, yeah, that was the only thing that was that that sticks out to me. But it really is remarkable how, how like how beautiful like each and every single one of their voices are. Mm, cool. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, why do you ask that? Um, I I've just been thinking about the idea of of music as part of our evolution as a as humans and how mm-hmm. um, some of the first inventions are flutes and musical instruments going going back tens of thousands of years. And mm-hmm. and how music brings people together, and it, I don't know. I've just um, popped into my head. One of my goals is to to go to Africa and sit in the in drum circle. Oh yeah, and and just really experience what I feel like might be the the center of the percussion universe. <laughs> yeah, that's oh man, I like that. And, and drums, yeah, that'd be a, a whole other field that I I didn't even touch on. But yeah, I mean they're they're insanely good drummers and insanely energetic, and they dance and all that other stuff. Yeah, well, I really just need to spend some time in Africa. <laughs> you do, yeah. It's an amazing place. Um, well, Gret, I want to I want to acknowledge you for a second for the work you're doing, and it's directly I can see that it's directly impacting and helping a lot of people, and and so that's that's amazing. I also want to salute you for like you talked about in the interview, looking into the future and seeing how and having that perspective to see how the work you're doing could could go into the future or not and then you know taking advantage of of technology we have now with smartphones and all these to create this platform i think you it's, it's very cutting edge and it's just the right time and so and you you get to be the person to do that so so i want to salute you for for being the right person at the right time to to make all this happen and changing lots of people's lives well thank you man i i very kind of you to say that and um I'm doing my best, and I appreciate you having me on this podcast so I can share what I'm doing with your audience. It means a lot. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Gret. All right, take care. Bye-bye. All right, great episode with Gret Glyer, and I think it's it's really a perfect solution he's created. I'm going to spend some time on the app and do some donation, play around with that. And it's fun. It's fun to if you go and look and find ways where you can feel great about yourself for not much money. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you feel like you want to give or if you feel like you're looking for a way to feel more fulfilled, uh, just, just consider what he said. You know, you don't necessarily have to bring yourself to the point where it's uncomfortable, but just have a think also about that idea. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to give until it hurts? Just Just something to think about. I remember... Uh, Carolyn Elliott said, what are you willing to sleep outside in the rain for? So that also helps you reflect on what you really value in your life. And uh, speaking of value, I really value adventure. So I'm going to mention again, Adventure Quest in Missouri this fall, October 12th to 19th. Uh, That happens to be peak leaf season. So you can see the fall foliage colors changing. We're, we're going to really take advantage of Missouri's prime natural features, the cliffs, the, the caves, the caves actually in Arkansas, uh, the natural springs that let rivers flow year-round in the beautiful Ozark Mountains. Did you know there was mountains down there? Maybe not. Uh, it's going to be an awesome trip, plus an amazing group of people that you're going to be spending time with, plus a business retreat. We got, we got it all rolled into one trip. So hold on to your britches and head over to 
com slash adventure quest and apply. And that's, that's all for today's episode. So you know what time it is. It's time to go out there and be adventurous. Mm-hmm.